And, you know, the one thing that I always revert back to when things are really bad and things are like excruciatingly painful and there's, you know, there's just, there's just build up and build up of lactate just in your system and it's hard to breathe and everything feels like everything's coming to an end is breath. Always revert back to breath. I think about controlling my breathing and I control my breathing with my movement flow. So if I'm going through wall balls and I'm under the pump and it is hard and heavy and things are starting to deteriorate and my contraction is starting to buckle under me, I always revert back to clean movement, what I've practiced, smooth like this, breathe on the timing for every throw. And that's all I do, breathe with the timing for the throw each time. And I kind of get in, try and get into like almost a, uh, a uh, uh, what are they called? Um, not a, it's not a pendulum. Uh, it's like a, it's just a, a flow of movement on the same time frame. So breathe with it every time. So I always revert back to breath. Breath controls my speed. And if I'm under control of my breath, my speed will maintain as best as I possibly can. And that's just allowing me to continue on at my maximal capacity without getting to the point where I have to stop or have to slow down. So it's always reverting back to breath. When you, when you look at the bigger picture of us operating as humans in general, the one thing that we need to sustain life next is breath. Over and above food, over and above water, over and above connection, over and above everything else, the one next thing we need is breath. And if that is out of control, that is the first thing we need to think about getting it back in control. And if we're not in control when we're working out, we're out of control, we're not giving ourselves the best opportunity to do well. So it's always everything starts to get pushed away from you. All your, your thoughts around energy, your thoughts around how you're feeling, your thoughts around everything. And as it gets harder and harder and harder, it comes back to this one thing, which is breath. I need my breath to continue to work. So that's what I think about. Nice. Nice. Um, and uh, another Maybe kind of mindset question. I know you've spent time training with Tia, Claire Toomey, one of the best athletes ever, really. Um, yeah. how, how would you see, like, if you look at, at, at yourself and Tia, are there certain aspects that you think separate you and her from other very well, very, very talented athletes that, that maybe don't quite reach those levels? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I think there's there's there needs to be and this is just one aspect of probably a dozen or half a dozen things that would i could think of if i spent some hardcore time thinking about it but one thing is we're we're both very much fascinated by progression and fascinated by increasing our performance capacity but not to the detriment where it starts to take over and you start to overanalyze things there there is a a point in time where You've asked as many questions as you need to ask and discerning when that is and getting to work next is a thing where I think a lot of people fail. Some people will ask the right questions and then get to the point and get to work and make it happen and make a change. And then some people will spend the next 12 months asking questions and still have done no work. That is probably one of the biggest things that I see so much is just like, okay, cool. You've asked enough questions, now put it into play. And if you want it to work, get to work. And do it in almost silence. Do it because you want to do it. Have the right reason set behind, you know, the dream or the goal. And then it's just like, I'm going to work on this thing day in, day out and be relentless towards the task. And Tia is one of the most relentless hard workers I've ever seen. She would do very well in a high rock setting, 100%. She can, she'll honestly, in terms of running capacity and ability, she's, insane like insane insane and yeah i haven't seen a harder worker ever in my life yeah she's uh she's on another level for sure and she understands when you just got to put your head down and you got to get to work and yeah you just have to put yourself in a situation where you know give yourself the right environment to train in give yourself the right people to hang around to train with get yourself good training partners and understand that you got to trust the process and luckily she and Shane have a fantastic process that they, you know, wholly and solely back. But yeah, she knows when to get to work and she's not, she's not rattled by anything. She could have a bad snatching day and, you know, be missing her percentages. And then 
the next thing you know, we're into a workout and she's, you know, that would, that would um, play with someone's mind and that, you know, they will throw the next workout away. That actually fires her up and she goes even harder to try and prove a point. Whereas people break at that point when you're, when you're missing your percentages three weeks out of the CrossFit games and you're just, you're feeling buckled and you're tired, you're neurally fatigued, you know, you're hitting 80% of your max and you're struggling with it. You're just like, what is wrong with me to then finish it off not feel good about it and to go into a hard workout post that and still throw down really hard. She's got some mental fortitude there. She's very, um, she's very uh, resilient. That's for sure. So I think resilience plays a big toll. And she also, and this is built upon years and upon years of training, training a lot. And this is one other thing. And this is a highlighted point that I think a lot of people could probably pull from when you're training for the CrossFit games, you don't train for that one year. Then you're training that year to build a base to sit upon. When you get to the next year, you can't just build back to that base. You need that base as your next foundational point that you're then working from. And that's what T has done every year, which is why she has stayed in the lead because in 2015, they built to here. And then from 2015, they built from 2015 to 2016, 16 to 17, 17 to 18. And it wasn't like I'm going to build into 16, revert back to 15 to get back to 16 to qualify for 17. It's not the way it works. If you want to maintain your lead, you have to build on every year. So the good thing that they did was they maintained and they know all of Tia's stats from 15, 16, 17, 18, and made sure she was ahead of those stats the whole way through. So she's always getting better. And it was just, you know, it's data it's precise training as looking at, you know, the broader picture, which Shane is fantastic at. He's got a, he's got a mind for it, which not everybody has either. Next up is a clip from my episode with the brilliant Peter Kelly, where he talks about some of his inspirations from the world of sport. I've got a lot of, there's a lot of people that inspire me. There's no doubt about that. And, and whilst I absolutely admire the elites and I'll perhaps come on to one or two of the elites in a moment, I'm more inspired by the ordinary person that does the extraordinary. So, for example, I mean, some some people, some of your you know your listeners may may know of these people, but if not, I suggest they they Google them and have a look at them because I, uh, once I got myself into triathlon, I was uh, I was just doing short distance triathlons, and one night I, uh, one night I, there was an article on um, on Euro Sport. It was about a lady called Sister Madonna Buddha. She was 81 years old. She must weigh about 50 to 55 kilograms. And she just completed the world championships at Ironman in Kona, Hawaii, within the cutoff. And the big difference with Ironman and a marathon is that you have a cutoff. You, you start a marathon and you can walk it and you'll get your medal. But at Ironman, there's cutoffs all along. There's cutoffs on the swim. There's two or three cutoffs on the bike, two or three cutoffs on the run so that you that they know that if you're still on the course you'll finish within the allotted 17 hours because if you don't do that you don't get a medal so i thought to myself well if an 81 year old nun can finish an iron man in 17 hours and surely i can do that so i read up about sister madonna buddha and i really would encourage everyone to google her she's a phenomenal lady i think she's done something something like 25 to 30 ironmans i think she's now she's now now 92 i'm not quite sure what she's doing now but she's certainly the oldest ever female finisher in an ironman so there's people like that that do extraordinary things and she only started she only started running I think at the age of about 55, 56. And then by the age of 80, she'd done 20 or 30 full Ironmans. So that that's so yeah, I would I'd, I think everyone should look up Sister Madonna Buddha. And there's another there's another inspiration that I have. It's from America. Um Rick and Dick Hoyt, known as Team Hoyt. Um sadly the father has re- recently passed away. He was in his 80s. Um, but the son had cerebral palsy. And um, once he was able to communicate through a computer to his dad, and that took many, many years, um, he said he wanted to do a, a, a 5K. So the dad would put his son in a, in a, in like a, 
a push chair for want of a better word and the dad uh dick hoyt would push him on a 5k so they did a 5k then they did a 10k then they did a half marathon and they were raising money for charity and stuff like this then they do a um then they do the boston marathon i think 35 boston marathons later they have a, a statue in boston to rick and dick hoyt but that's they didn't finish there they decided to do an ironman so if you could imagine um, the father, who must have been in his 40s at the time, starting off on the swim, he puts his son in a dinghy in, in the back. So his, his, the son is sat in a dinghy with a rope. The father then swims 2.4 miles in the sea, gets out at the end of the swim, picks his son up, pops him in the carriage at the front of a, a they, they've transformed a, bike, a, a special bike, the dad then cycles 112 miles with his son in at the front of the bike, get off the bike, puts him in a push chair and pushes him for a marathon. And he finishes it within the 17 hours. Now, I, if you're not inspired by that, then you might as well give up. And, I, and there's, there's a lot of a lot of the footage on YouTube is a little bit old. So it's a bit grainy, some of the footage. But um I think Team Hoyt is something else. If no, if you've never looked up Team Hoyt, look it up. It's absolutely amazing. It's very emotional as well. Next, we get to hear from Felicity Cole, where she talks about some of the factors that she thinks is important in High Rocks, over and above just being a good runner and physically strong. So this, definitely being a good runner and definitely having strength matters, especially if you want to be in those but if you take the let's say the top five girls and if you look at their wobbles they're like flawless their their ability to move in that path is like absolutely flawless and that's why they can do a hundred easily at the end um so their structural balance they're like the way they move and so it's not just that they are strong and they're fast they just move well Mm -hmm. so that's one of the things so if you look at people who are struggling look at it more so with the guys like there's not so many guys that can do them unbroken because if there's any kind of like imbalance in the body that's like some muscles are working harder than others that movement which they just the girls just like bounce out the bottom and make it look like there's no effort involved then something is going to fatigue whether it's like the shoulders or the legs so that's in terms of working on like overall structural balance and just um just that kind of like calisthenic type gymnastic type strength where you just move really well you've got good coordination you've got good agility so I think that plays into it a lot so just general um being a good all-round athlete helps um in that sense so you're not overly fatiguing certain muscles when you're on any particular exercise like the lunge if you over using the quads you're going to burn out on those you kind of want to share the load so that was what I was talking about in terms of like the structural balance and then I think just general like if I talk from my background just from always training always like um carrying like even simple things just like always carrying my own shopping like we have a joke that when we go and fill up the water in the mountain we're carrying that ourselves so uh we spend a lot of time on I walk like 12 to 15,000 steps a day. Um, so on your feet a lot. I just think all of these little things, I sit on the ground all of the time because that's what I prefer. I think all of these little things count to making you strong in a, like you don't need to spend hours and hours like uh, foam rolling or stretching because you just like, you you move well. You just have that, um, just like being like a, a human should be so then I think if you're starting from that base it's way easier to then build on that rather than if you have to um sort out bits that feel tight or um that kind of thing and then what else did I say in there um well uh, you, you also mentioned grit and resilience I think what where where I reflect from in a race is other races and experiences and events I've had and I call on them and I think nothing will ever be as painful or as tough or as like um enduring as that and I kind of reflect on that so when I'm like suffering or hurting I'm like this is like nothing it's fine um for example in a marathon in the marathon I did I collapsed on the finish line and was then on a drip for two hours like because I pushed that hard and then um, like on 
the attack de tour, uh, the the weather. So it was like 212k, the stage of the Tour de France on the bike. And um, it was so, inc- I can take like quite extremes of temperature. I'm okay with heat and cold, but it was so incredibly cold. And my hands like froze up on the bike. I couldn't break down the hills. I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I was so cold. I think I was on the close to... Um, like you know when you can't uh function and but then like nine hours later you finish the race and you're like well I got through that and at one point I thought you know I was going to die um but I finished it I got through it and um so from long endurance events I think endurance events give you that feeling of wow this is so hard but I did it I made it so now like an hour's high rocks I'm like okay this is it hurts but it's fine like I've done harder things um so I think there's many different ways of seeing grit um and for me it's it comes the feeling of that comes from having done previous events I was lucky enough to get to talk to world champion Hunter McIntyre twice in the year this next clip is from the first of those episodes where We spoke just after he'd broken the world record in Barcelona and I asked him what he thinks about during the depths of the race. You know, it's funny. I have been doing this since I've been about 16, not knowing what it is. Um, So if you listen to all these like really, really like high level spirituality arrival books, as they'd like to call it, you being in that like, you know, next level of ascension of, you know, your, uh, whatever it's called enlightenment. You hear all this stuff. It's a little bit, you know, long winded for me, but I still listen to it to just kind of redefine my understanding and get better at it. But when I used to be 16, I watched this movie with these aliens and there was this big alien that was coming to destroy the planet. And it was a joke movie, but he was, his name was Kroger. He's like, Kroger is the strongest. Kroger is the best. Kroger can be like, you know, all these things. And like, they stomp around. And I just started saying that in my cross country races, as I was just beating the piss out of all these other kids. And I just kept on doing it forever. And it's been the same kind of dialogue forever where I just – I catch myself out there on these runs and I'm like, my legs are dead. My head's going to explode. And then all of a sudden I get into my narrative, my mantra, and then I'm gone. Like literally all of a sudden I go from like, uh, boom, and, and I just am out and I'm moving so quickly. And the more I say it, the more almost like everything else dissipates. I can't – I'm not thinking of people. I'm not thinking of the next station. I'm not thinking of anything other than the exact act in the moment as I'm doing it, as if no one else could do it. No one else could be here. No one else could understand this. Yet, just from being here, you're already above that. You're above that idea. I know that sounds odd, but you just kind of transcend into this space and you're going. You don't even know it until you're there. And you're like, oh my God, I just ran two laps and I'm back on the entrance again and I'm on world record pace. And uh, that's where I end up. That's where I end up. I I don't even notice the movements. I just notice the being above and beyond everything that's going on. I'm just, I'm above it. I know that sounds odd. Nice. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Is there is there some like you you said about like is there affirmations in there? Are you like are you when you're in that place are you telling yourself like I'm the best? One hundred percent. I honestly tell myself I'm a god king all the time. It's like not a god, not a king, a god king. <laughs> In the next clip, we hear from elite athlete Terra Jackson, where we talk about body image in sport and in high rocks, and also fueling for the sport. You know, it's hard to say, like, when you have, especially in America, like people of color or people or women in positions of power, if there aren't positions, people that look like you there. So it's hard for women growing up, like, imagine being president, because we've never had a female president. So it's hard to like imagine what that would look like. So when you're in sport and you have like this idea of like, oh, I don't look like any of these athletes. Like I could never be good at this sport because I don't look like any of them. So you have to look a certain way 
to be part or to be good or to be part of the sport. Cause even I think it's hard for people, even if you're not trying to compete at the top level, like people have this idea in their mind, like, Oh, I can't run because I'm not built like a runner or I don't have a runner's body or I can't dance because I don't have a dancer's body. So I think, again, we talk about these barriers, whether they're created by a race or created by yourself that you don't let yourself experience things because you have this idea in your mind that you can't do it so i think by having you know a sport that embraces you know all kinds of different body types whether you know they're muscular or ripped or whatever um and you have people who are thin and you know they're all like competing they're all doing the sport so i mean i can see my I, i'm a personal trainer so i could see taking one of my clients actually my roommate went to um uh madrid with me so she's a marathon runner and um she does this stuff and she's like i she's like i could never do this this looks awful but because and she's like i just can't do this kind of stuff and i was like well you could you just you know you do it slower um so i think she sees all these people that are super fit and super ripped and whatever and um she's like well i can't be like them so I don't know. I'm, I mean, it's, it's in your head, but at the same time, like your mind is very powerful. So like growing up as a runner, like all the people I, I saw that were top level athletes, cause I wanted to compete. They didn't look like I looked, I was just always kind of like a bigger, bigger runner. I had coaches through college and high school that were like, Oh, well, if you could just lose five pounds or if you could just lose 10 pounds, like I was already, I look back at pictures. I was like, I was really fucking skinny. Like I was, not overweight at all but like this whole idea that being lighter is faster is so ingrained in the running community that like it's hard to like push that aside um so i think a lot of athletes i mean a lot of my friends that are in the running community more of them had have 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 had eating disorders than haven't because it's just so entwined in like the culture that you have to the skinnier you are the faster you run so i think that we can break down some of like these ideas with sports like high rocks because you see all these different people on the starting line and none of them look the same so i think it's easier even if you don't see someone who looks exactly like you it doesn't appear that there's like a certain type of person that can do these events so I think it maybe it makes it easier to conceptualize yourself doing doing stuff like that if it doesn't appear that one type of person is the type of person that does them. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm um I do I do nutrition calls with people like preparing for high ups and I'm 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 speaking to a lot of people who are tired at the moment. Um partly because like they're just training so much but i think they're coming from that mindset of they need, they need to be light they they're under fueled like they're not eating anywhere near enough carbs i think they're getting a lot of nutrition advice from the bodybuilding community or the weight loss community as opposed to like performing for high rocks community um, yeah so i'm certainly sort of seeing that carry i, I know you posted something similar um on your instagram i think the, the other week wasn't it about you know under fueling and, and, and under fueling at the right times and making sure you're fueled during the season and so on yeah i mean it's way more in my mind it's incredible more detrimental to your performance to be under fueled than over fueled so mm. if you're a little over fueled um, i mean it's not you're probably going to burn it up anyways like through through exercise so being a little over fueled I'd rather be that than under, but I think, um, you know, there are going to be situations where maybe losing weight would be beneficial to your performance. Like I have a client that runs marathons and he's probably like 40 pounds overweight, but you know, for me, and it may be even be more comfortable, uncomfortable for me to breach that subject because of my like own experiences. Like I don't want to develop a disordered eating pattern, but like there are also detriments to being overweight as an athlete. Like, you know, you put extra strain on your joints, but, and you know, it's just harder on your body, but most athletes you probably work with aren't overweight. They're just, mm -hmm. you know, they aren't eating enough 
to support like the amount of exercise that they're doing. So I think that people just need to feel, feel themselves like based on their performance, not like, cause I, I don't really do anything specific now. I'll track every now and then just to make sure really that I'm eating enough. Um, cause like you said, I, you know, don't really get enough carbs. So I like, sometimes I'll be like, Oh, need to track my calories, make sure I'm eating enough. And I'm almost always eating enough now. It's just, it's easier to get calories from fat. So for the mm -hmm. amount of food that I need to eat, it's, it's kind of hard to get that amount of volume. If you eat a low fat diet or not that I would eat a low fat diet, but it's easier to get my calories in if a lot of them are coming from fat. Cause then you need like less food volume. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's it's a huge problem in the athlete community with just underfueling, and then you're tired, and then you blame that fatigue on the training. But really, maybe your body could handle the training if it was fueled properly. Yeah. Uh, so, and then a lot of people it leads them to injury from chronic underfueling because when you don't eat enough, then it's not just pulling from your fat; it's pulling from your bones and you know, your body's not able to appropriately recover the way it should. People get stress fractures, you know, all kinds of different injuries from something that in my mind doesn't even have to happen. You know, if you're kind of aware of what you're putting in and what you're expending. Mm -hmm. Next is Australian athlete James Kelly, where I ask him a few quick fire questions, starting with what's the toughest thing that he's ever done in sport? Toughest thing I've ever done. And to date, nothing comes, nothing comes close. Sport or in, in fitness exercise, I was able to um, work for my father when I was a little bit younger, who took... Um, who took um, trips to Mount Kilimanjaro in Kenya. Sorry, Tanzania. Sorry, Tanzania. Long story short, I was one of the, the tour guides with the um, with the proper tour guides over there, but um, I was asked to do the Kilimanjaro trek twice in a row. I had to do the, um, the summit, summit climb one night, come back, for one night and then do it another second time um in the space of three nights and to to date there's nothing there's nothing that i've done that comes even close to that mental toughness that i went through though that night um especially with the altitude the cold the weather um yeah um nothing nothing comes close to doing Kilimanjaro twice in the space of three, three nights. Wow. How old were you then? 19. Okay. It was about 10 years ago now. Yeah. About 10 Amazing. years ago. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, zone two training overrated or underrated? Underrated. Absolutely underrated. Um, my athletes and I, um, do at least one zone two specific workout a week. Um, think about if your zone two is, if your zone two threshold is um, this big, your 80 to 90% um, isn't going to be as big as it should be. What I'm sorry, that didn't really make sense. But if your zone two threshold is, is large, it only makes your, 80 90 100 percent larger so you've got to start from zone two i believe you've got to really um build a base more than anything it, it's better to build a base and starting trying to do interval training and and race pace training now you, you've got to start from zone two okay um pure strength work this is in the context of high rocks pure strength work like Heavy deadlifts, heavy squats, overrated or underrated? Depends on the individual. Um, um, if you do have a solid foundational strength as as a person, definitely uh, overrated. Um, personally, as an athlete training for high rocks, pure strength. I don't. I I do. I do one pure strength session a fortnight. 
um, if that, depending on what's coming up. Um, but the answer to the question is it's specific to the individual. If you don't have a, if you haven't been lifting for at least a year, if not more than that, to be honest, um, then you should have, have a couple of pure strength sessions a week. Um, but if you've been a developed Hyrox athlete for a year or so, understand how, you know, the sleds work and whatnot pure pure strength work is definitely overrated for for high rocks next up we hear from world champion lauren weeks where she gives us an insight into her running training so it's been different um this year specifically um let's see maybe six to eight weeks before manchester i changed my run training um previously like i would only do long slow runs and nothing else and i've been doing that since i don't know i was like 16 and i'm 33 now so uh, i've had many many years of like just base training um and then just with like all the different uh even just the different sports like we've got high reps and deca i've realized like i i need to change that because if like i need to be able to access a different speed and hold a different speed if I want to be able to keep up with everybody. So I actually started properly yeah. run training. Um, so I've added like different like speeds and threshold work and um, like uh, tempo work into my training this year. So I think I've just, I've, I've had that like kind of rookie bump, I guess, even though it's not my rookie season because I went from one type of run training to changing it to actually doing different speed work and threshold work okay what what might can you give an example session i know people will ask so what might one of these example sessions look like yeah so um i still uh i still will do like the majority of my runs of of long runs and then twice a week i'll do some something so if i were to do a threshold session for example um i could do five by eight minutes with like a set rest period and then um and then i would either cool down depending on how my legs feel it'll either be on the row or i'll get back out on a run um, i try and make sure that on those particular days i'm not overworking my legs because it's much more demanding on them mm -hmm. uh when i'm trying to trying to run fast than if i were just going out and jogging so like very simple straightforward like five sets of eight minutes with hard work and a set rest period where I'm actually resting and not doing anything else so that I can go back and hit that next session hard. Um, and then those, those intervals change. Like I don't do the same interval set like every single time to make sure that I'm like working different kind of time capacities. Yeah, sure. And is that five by eight minutes at a uh, pretty much like high rocks race pace faster? No. And I think that's um, probably surprising to people as well. Like I don't touch race pace that often. Um, I'll work at like a hard pace, like something that's harder than if I were to just go out and jog. Um, but I don't, I don't go all the way up to race pace very often. I think that can be, um, I feel like it could set you backwards if you, if you are doing that too often, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's better to stay under that. And if you're consistent, I think that's better than like over revving because uh, there's a good chance that you might have to stop working out for a little bit. In the next clip, we hear from the UK's fastest woman, Rebecca Mason, where she talks about some of the things that she thinks about during a race. Um, so I have a little bit of a mantra, which is this is my fun. And it's just reminding me that I am choosing to be here. But I feel very grateful to be on that start line um, because, one, I'm in good health. I've got there because my, my injuries are not so bad. Um, there's a lot of people who haven't got the opportunity to do this. So I try and flip it over and, and say, like, this is my choice. I don't have to do this. Nobody's making me do this. I'm here because I want to do this. And ultimately, I'm, I'm good at this. So let's let's push. Let's do this. 
um and and enjoy it and, and realize like that this is my happy place like uh, this is what you've trained for actually an event is kind of the icing on the cake now what you've done previously is is the hard work this is this is the fun bit um and obviously having my kids at events they'll be there in manchester so seeing them and giving them a little high five on the way through you know hopefully um it's inspiring them and um i think the only influencer that I, I set out to be is to be a good influence on, on those two. And um, if they can see that mummy's capable of doing hard things, then they can absolutely do it as well. So, um, yeah, having them in the forefront of my mind is is definitely what my why. In the next clip, we hear from the world champion in the 55 to 59 age group, Mimushka Kion, where she talks about getting older and staying active. I think when you become older, what I see with my clients when they become older, I'm old. First of all, I tell them, never say you're old because there's no old. There's only older. We're becoming older. And be happy, otherwise you have to die young. It's not other things. So then people give up. They're like, I'm old, can't do it anymore. I'm 50. You know, I'm like, I'm like, no, you lost it. It's not necessary. So in that sense, I really hope to be an example. I like to be an example and not like I'm here and I did, but it's all possible. It's all possible. And not even like crazy like me. With little adjustments, you can achieve so much. Mm -hmm. And this is something I like to reach to people. I like to tell them it's like, you know, definitely older and definitely women and I'm a woman, I'm an example in the hormones. We go like this, the menopause. You know what? There's a way, there's a way. Next up is a clip from a conversation with elite athlete Dylan Scott, where he talks about some of the common traits that he sees in the elite athletes within High Rocks. What I think is actually interesting is, and, and I mean, I've only had, you know, a couple of podcasts to really get to chat with people, six, seven. Um, but just talking with not even just the podcast, just people in general, how with like people in general, high level in the sport, how different every athlete seems to be in that mm. I'll stumble across a couple of people where it's like, oh, yeah, we're similar. I get it. Like you just love the effort. You love to just go like give effort. Some are super dialed in process oriented. Some are super like I just happen to be really good at this. Some are I really love effort. And it's, I, I can't actually draw a line of, oh, like this is the kind of, this is the kind of trend line for everyone. And if we had, you know, X and Y axis to break down like certain parameters, this is where you would see, hey, all the elites seem to fall here. Super scatter shot, except for one thing, and that's just focused. Like, if you talk to people, that are in the sport, they're just focused. And if you ask them questions, like even if they seem like, oh, this is some easygoing person, they're not really thinking, they're thinking about it. It it never quite leaves their mind, mm -hmm. regardless of what their process is. Regardless of if they're thinking about it in the abstract or in the very concrete, like piece together this week, next week, this, like it never goes away. And so it's almost like they have this kind of nagging bug at them that they're like, I'm thinking about it. I know. I know what this person's doing. Um, I know what I should be doing. And whether or not I'm showing it outwardly, inwardly, that passion is there for everybody. Yeah. That's what I, that's at least kind of what I pick up. Yeah. It's, um, I've, I've, like, I've thought about the question myself because I've talked to a lot of people when the personalities are so different, aren't they? Like between even just like the Elite 15s, the, 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 yeah. there's so much difference. Um, I think I think there is an element of grittiness. Like once the once the starting gun goes, yes. I think they probably and it's hard to quantify what they're what they're all thinking at that time. But I suspect their their grittiness in the race uh, is is maybe different to 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 other people. Um, well, it, even if like their personalities are different away from the race. Yeah, yeah. It's like when that gun goes off. That's when everybody allows whatever that like inward kind of bug is to come out yeah so some people that sits like really close to the surface and you can tell their life is sport 
some people it's it's really down deep and their life doesn't seem like sport but the minute the gun goes off that sport bug's like here we are and everybody like <laughs> they're like hey everybody show of hands who's like if you if you were like 30 seconds of the race stop everybody show of hands who's ready to beat the shit out of the other person on the line <laughs> yeah everybody's hand goes up yeah. <laughs> like so yeah yeah that's that, that's what's there just that. that's how i think about it even something like i don't know the, the night like linda meyer for example who seems so like so lovely oh yeah um, I, I would imagine in the race if you, you you're right yeah it's the um, it's that sort of mentality a hundred percent linda meyer like outside of the race seems super nice inside of the race she might bite you like you never know um, <laughs> <laughs> like what Next up is a clip from my chat with Jane Erbacker from Erg Army. This is one of our most popular podcast episodes of the year. It's one that people tell me that they listen to time and time again. So if you haven't yet listened to it, or if you've only listened to it once or twice, then it is worth revisiting. In this particular clip, she shares a workout that she recommends for people to work out the best damper setting for them when they're on the row or the ski. A lot of people... It's not that they don't believe me, but it's that for so many people, they've done things a certain way on the rower that when you come along and you change it, they have like this emotional attachment. To what doing. So a really great benchmark workout is actually three rounds of 90 seconds on, three rounds of 60 seconds on, three rounds of 30 seconds on with 30 seconds rest between every round. So you'd go 90 on, 30 off, 90 on, 30 off, 90 on, 30 off, 60, 30, 60, 30, 60, 30, et cetera. And the way that this would work is you do your first round of 90 seconds with your damper on a one or a two. And then you do your second round of 90 seconds with your damper on a four or a five. And your third round of 90 seconds with your damper on a nine or a 10. And then you do your three rounds of 60 with your damper low, medium, high. And then your three rounds of 30, low, medium, high. And the idea is that throughout the entire duration of that, you hold your 2K pace. So the interesting thing that happens with this is you see that it's quite easy to start with and then it's really easy to get to pace on that 90 seconds at, with your damper high but that last 30 seconds is a real grind because you start to slow down the stroke rate and you start to feel the cost of the high damper the high of the high damper feels amazing for about 300 meters you feel really unstoppable and then the fatigue that sets in happens everywhere and so when you get back to that first that first round of 60 seconds you're tired from that 90 seconds so in terms of a benchmark the idea is that it's programmed into the monitor so you can see the overall picture of what you've done you can see the individual efforts and how you've matched your stroke rate to where the damper is and you can see the cost of a high damper so the reason i give that out as a benchmark is i'm trying to convince people that a nine or a ten doesn't yield the best results unless it's 100 metres, unless it's four times the amount of rest and work, unless it's like proper power training and you have sufficient technique to understand how to apply it. Um, but, yeah, I'm trying to convince people that they can create a better result at a lower damper. So that's a really cool benchmark workout. Next, we hear from Michaela Norman, one of the fastest ever female athletes in the sport, where she talks about her inspirations. I think I've always been just inspired of everyone hunting to like, like chasing their dreams, whatever it is, it could be like, it doesn't have to be sports. Just trying to, to believe that you can do what you want mm -hmm. and like working your ass for getting there even though it might not even be possible, just believe in yourself. And I just, I, I think I can find motivation in, in, in different kinds of humans uh, with just the, yeah, with their, their thinking of like, yeah, striving for something or believing in themselves. So I don't have like one person. I think I just collect motivation from different kinds of areas um, and I think like we're all more or less the same even though you want something that is not within sports you want something in a different area it's still 
it's still the same process. It's still the work has to be done and nothing really comes for free. Uh, so I think that's just what what I get motivated of. Okay, all right. Um, and then my last question is, if, if you were going to put a message out on a billboard for, for all the world to see, what would it say? That you should believe in yourself and believe in that you can. And I would also say that what I, what I always think about is that the only thing I can do is to do my best. Mm -hmm. And then I can be happy. So as long as you put in and do your best, that's the only thing you can do. Next up, I was lucky enough to get to speak to Olympic legend Eve Muirhead, where she talks about how a slight change in her approach in her final Olympics won her the gold medal and how you might be able to apply that to your high rocks racing. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, Beijing just passed. That was my um, that was my fourth Olympics. Um, and there was a time like when I maybe my first Olympics in Vancouver, two thousand and ten. You you go into those games and you're kind of fearless. You're not scared of losing. Um, like you're kind of like a rabbit in headlights. You're soaking it all in. You're enjoying it. Um, and then as your kind of career progresses and um, things kind of get a little more kind of serious, you maybe get a little bit more kind of known, you're, you're kind of expected to do well. That's when it kind of comes in that, yeah, of course, you're, you're scared to lose. You're scared to make mistakes. Um, you're, you're playing games not to win them, but not to lose them. And um, that, that's not the way you want to you wanna approach. Um, so after after not qualifying first time around for Beijing, like it was it was a pretty tough time that that I did go through, and um, I needed to kind of reassess a lot a lot of of why why I was scared to to lose, why I was kind of punishing myself for every little small mistake I made. Like I expected everything to be perfect, and if it wasn't inch perfect, like it wasn't good enough. And um, believe you me, come Beijing, like we made a lot of mistakes, but I think because we, or myself, I dealt with them in a very different way to what I just, I had previously. Um, I kind of assessed what I did. I I then kind of fixed it instead of kind of dwelling on it, making a kind of mohill into a mountain um, with, with the mistakes. And um, I think that that definitely helped us achieve the gold medal. Um, in terms of enjoying it more, um, not scared of, as I say, making mistakes, giving everything a shot. Um, and um, yeah, for sure, it, it definitely helped me be successful there. It's interesting. I um, I was in Chicago at the weekend and um, I went to this this track session with Chris Hinshaw, who's like an endurance coach, quite prominent in CrossFit. And he was talking to high rocks athletes before the race. And he said, like, you've got to take risks and like you, you can't be afraid to to lose, you know, like you were just saying. And it is it is easy in high rocks. Like I talk about pacing a lot and not going out too hot and all those kinds of things. But at the same time, you have to take risks as well if you if you really yeah. want to win and get a good result. It was quite interesting, like the, the parallels between between what you just said and what he said. No, um, I definitely I think I think that's very important. I think if you're very cagey the whole time, like you you're never gonna progress. You're just gonna stick at a kind of plateau. And and I found that with my curling for a long time. Everyone was getting better, but I was kind of plateauing because I was too scared to take that risk, too scared to take that next step. Um and like like what you just said, when when you do, and um yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but he at least you tried. Um yeah. and the majority of the time maybe it doesn't work the first time, but I'll guarantee it'll probably work the second or third time. Yeah. This final clip for this episode is from sports psychologist Josephine Perry. Again, one of our most popular episodes of the year that is full of so much good content. Uh, this is just one of many clips that I could have chosen from the episode. So if you've not yet listened to it, I highly recommend that you do so. A really a basic example, but a guy I once did a workshop with, we were talking about motivational mantras and kind of what would work as a good mantra to get you through and get you working harder at something. And he said, I used to be super, super overweight. I went to the doctors. Doctors told me I wouldn't make it to 30 unless I sorted my health out. He was like, it was the kick I needed. So I went to the gym. I trained really hard. I went on a diet. I lost loads of weight. I ended up joining a triathlon club, which is how he, I'd ended up meeting him. And he said, I did my first triathlon. Swim was awful, but I got through it. Bike was awful, but I got through it. 
the run, I wanted to quit. It was horrible. And he said, I ran past my dad. My dad said to the guy standing next to him, that's my son. And he's like, damn it. Because it sounded like, he was so proud of him. He was like, I can't quit now, can I? <laughs> he was like, any tricky thing that comes up now, all he hears in his voice, in his head is his dad's voice, that's my son. And at that point, he's he finds that extra bit of energy that you need to be able to push yourself harder. And I think for all of us, if we know why we are doing something, why it matters, we can find that extra bit of energy. Mm -hmm. um, so I can imagine for the kind of competitions that your listeners are doing, you're going to get to points where you feel exhausted. You feel like you're totally empty. But research has shown they do muscle biopsies to find this out. Sounds horrific. But they will actually biopsy muscle when somebody says they're at total exhaustion. There's about 30% of energy left. So when our body shuts us down because we're exhausted, we're not. We've got extra if we need it. We just need to learn how to untap it. And the latest research suggests there's two ways. One is maxing out your motivation. So to absolutely know why you're doing it. And the other one is to reduce your perception of effort. So finding ways to make things feel a little bit easier for you. And if you can tap into those, then you can get the extra 30%. Okay. Is it that, that funny enough, that was going to be my next question about, you know, what, what would you advise to someone when it is in the depths of the race? What, what to think about? And it's something that when I talk to a lot of the, the athletes on this podcast, it's, it's a question that I always ask them. Um, understanding your why i think that makes sense um what, what would you say the, the, the second part about how to make something easier like what what yeah what, what would you advise there um so there's lots of things we use it's about reducing your perception of effort so your brain doesn't think what it's doing is as difficult as it is mm -hmm. so that it stops kind of almost tensing up and trying to stop you stop the efforts a really simple one smiling when you smile it tricks your brain into thinking what you're doing is a little bit more enjoyable a little bit easier and there's been great research on this there is also research to show um, when someone smiles at you it feels a little bit easier so they did some lovely research in the lab with cyclists on bikes where they um flashed up very, very quick images of faces whilst people were cycling. Those who saw smiley faces were able to go 16% longer than those that saw like growly, grumpy faces. So I love the idea that when we're doing something in the spectators, if we smile, they smile back at us. And the triathlon I did yesterday, I was grinning the whole way because it was awesome. But there was one marshal near one of the turnaround points and he was just yelling about smiling and he had this great big grin on his face and you could really almost suck in the energy that he was giving out through that it, it's amazing so if people can smile during events brilliant caffeine if it works for you so for some people they're pretty much caffeine non-responders not going to make much difference but if you're a response to it that can make what you're doing feel a lot easier Chunking stuff down is good. So I've recently been working with people doing UTMB. The, I think it's 171 kilometers round some serious mountain climbs. Um, and it's the biggest ultra distance race in the world, really. It's the one everyone tries to qualify for. Um, but if imagine standing on the start line thinking, I've got 171 kilometers to go. And I think they have 37 hours to do it or something. It's it's huge, way too big for our brain stuff. But if you chunk it down, I've got 10 until that aid station and I've got 12 until that thing. Suddenly it's doable. I just have to go for another 10 and then I get a rest or I get to do whatever. So um, the more you can chunk down what you're doing and just focus on that little bit in front of you, that's really helpful. Um, if it's quite an intense race, you want to be doing focus. So you want to be looking internally. And often then we'll be doing things like um, body checking. I love that annoying song, which you're now going to have in your head for the rest of the day. Head, shoulders, knees and toes. <laughs> uh, 
because you can then run through your body right what's my head doing my shoulders how movable are they am I in the right position for the move that I'm doing how are my knees and then how are my feet and then you can switch on occasionally with eyes ears am I tuned in to what's going on but you're giving yourself a body check of am I in the right position that I need to be in and if I'm not then how do I move it so I am um if you're doing longer stuff distraction is good so think about the tweet you're going to send afterwards think about the best I did London Marathon recently and some of the signs that people had were awesome and I was having like a mini competition in my head for like what's the best sign which one do I want to remember afterwards so anything like that is really good and another one is having support from people so if people go off to do events in teams, that can be really powerful. Um, I often say when someone's doing something like a marathon, you need your key supporter in a strategic point because you want to be looking forward to seeing them and you want to, they want to pre-agree the kind of thing you're going to shout out. Um, my daughter and I have this silly move that we do it's from Barbie, Barbie Mermaids. Um, but when I see her in a race, we do our silly move. And it makes me smile. It makes me feel happy for another five minutes. Brilliant. So things like that, mm -hmm. that can help keep your head in the game, but just make it feel like it's less difficult than it is. Really good at pushing you further. Yeah. And th th what, what you were saying about the chunking, especially is uh, quite relevant to high rocks. And some athletes have, have told me that, that, that they use that actually, because, because in high rocks, like you run a kilometre, and then you've got to do the skin and you run a kilometre and you do something else. And it's it's quite nice that it is broken down. There's always something like. new about to happen, you know. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and what's nice, actually, is then um, there's a chemical in our brain called dopamine, which we get as a like a reward chemical when we've ticked something off. And it sounds like you guys have that set off perfectly. It's like I've done that kilometre run. Right? I tick it off. I get that bit of dopamine. That helps push you into the next thing. Yeah. So really using that of kind of ticking off as you go through is an excellent way of feeling good about what you're doing. Yeah. 